welcome to the Fun Time Program. I'm your host, Vivica Volt, and this is my co-host, John Andrew Fredrickson. And today we are joined by our lovely guest, Athena Brinsberger, aka Astro Athens. Welcome. Thank you. I'm super excited to be here, guys. We're super excited to have you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you do? And you're a science communicator. What does that mean? What does that entail? How'd you get into it? Tell us everything. Yeah, so um, science communicator is kind of just like advocating to the public, educating the public about science, you know, like in, in a really fun way, a little bit more unconventional than kind of teaching in a classroom. So it's like through online media and going to museums, but it's mainly in space science. So I, I more so specialize in astrophysics because that's what my background is in. That's nice. what I studied in university and that's where my heart lays. I mean, astrophysics is pretty cool. That's one of our favorite topics. We're forever talking about space in the background here. <laughs> I love it. Well, what was your uh, background as a child? What, when did your excitement for space first come about? It first started when I was uh, t- about 12 years old, 11 to 12. I don't exactly remember what it was that I got the book, but I got a book while I was in class that were images taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. But back then, I didn't know they were real images. I thought they were just like paintings or artwork and like maybe, yeah, right. renditions. Yeah. And then my friend goes, no, these are real images of like galaxies and nebulae and they're billions of light years away. And there's probably like billions of stars like our sun and other planets that may have life on it. So at 12 years old, I had like my mind blown and was like, I got to go into space science. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> That is so cool. So you you pursued it in in um in college. You studied astrophysics, and then after after college, what what was your path that led you into science communication? Um, so it's actually during my research, um, I got scouted for America's Next Top Model, and um, decided to instead of do the show, pursue that as like my own career to see if I could really like sign with an agency. I was living in New York City, or I grew up there, mm-hmm. so I was like, maybe I can try to do both because I would have had to give away like all my research, mm-hmm. not give away, but stop my research in order to pursue the show. And I, I really kind of was like, maybe I should do mm-hmm. both. But by doing that, that, that journey, I've kind of learned about this whole other world, which is science communication, which essentially merges my passion for both things, which is like entertainment, being on stage, mm-hmm. learning how to communicate with the audience, which is also do acting and science. And, um, and that, that really was like the, the beautiful unison. And I was like, I think I got to pursue this as my career. That is amazing. That's so, cool. so, so where did you first get your start with science communication? I came across you first on the, the tomorrow show. Do they pronounce it tomorrow? It's spelled T M R O it's on YouTube. It's they, they we say, say the tomorrow, tomorrow right? show. Yeah. Right. Right. And, um, yeah, it's been so much fun to watch, you know, that show develop over, over the years and, and your involvement in that as well. And, and the excitement that everybody there brings to science communication, especially related to space and space exploration, which is something that we've been, you know, so excited about following over the past decade. Now that things mm-hmm. are kind of taking off again, you know, we had kind of had a quiet time in our childhood where space exploration wasn't you know, it wasn't in its heyday anymore. And now it's like taking off again. So getting to see all these amazing people that are rising, especially with the rise of social media to enable all these kind of alternative medias, people like Tim Dodd at Everyday Astronaut, um, all these different YouTubers that are, that are bringing this excitement for space to regular everyday people. So we have kids growing up today with this excitement for space. So how did you first get involved with tomorrow and, and the science communication world in general? Yeah, it's, it's so incredible what you were just saying about how it's really become such a, a, a prominent thing now in our lives, especially for kids now, because it's, it's surrounded us. I mean, even look at clothing, like you can easily get any type of NASA shirt or there's an Artemis program shirt, yes. mm-hmm. super cool. I actually got this for Christmas for my mom. Um, and, and it's so positive. So good. <laughs> Thanks. I'll let her know. But yeah, when we were growing up, it really wasn't that, that, you know, in our face, it wasn't that prominent. There weren't TV shows about it. Um, so the tomorrow show started, uh, which was really awesome because I had visited LA and my friend, Kevin J. DeBruin, who previously was known as the fit rocket scientist. Um, so he was a former NASA engineer, and was also competed on American Ninja Warrior. And he was interviewed on their show. Oh, wow. Yeah, I know. He's, he's so cool. Oh, he's so cool. Um, and so he introduced me to them and was like, hey, Athena's in town. Maybe he, she can go on the, on the Tomorrow Show for an interview. And um, afterwards, uh, we all like went out to lunch and they were like, you know, and they were like, how would you be, would you be interested in being one of our hosts? 
And I was like, actually, I'm moving to Los Angeles, like, you know, in, in a few months. And I'm like, that would be so great. And so I, mm -hmm. I ended up starting out there because I moved out there for um, for a couple of years. And so that's kind of how I got started with the Tomorrow Show. Um, but that really is an example of all the other work I've done. It's just been through friends and networking and, and connecting with people. Um, so really, I think welcoming community, the science community. Yes, this is true. Very much so. This is true. That is so cool. So how long uh, were you a host on The Tomorrow Show before you decided to start doing some of your own uh, science communication? Now you have your channel on YouTube, Astro Athens, which is phenomenal. Everybody's going to go check that out Absolutely. Uh, after this interview. We're going to post some links. <laughs> Definitely. What, when did you start doing your own production? So I actually started my own production before tomorrow, before The Tomorrow Show. Um, Yes, yeah, so I started um, Astro Athens uh, originally as a Twitter page, and it was actually because of America's Next Top Model, oh, wow. which is really funny. Um, Twitter was like really prominent. They're like, you have to, we want mm -hmm. you to create a social page in order to, you know, audition for the show. And I was like, I don't want to just write like, you know, model Athena. I was like, I want to keep right. space yes. in there. I was like, it needs to be astronomy. So I, I put Astro Athens and at, actually at that time, um, the old iPhone, like iPhone 3, all my friends in college it used to autocorrect my name Athena's oh. Athens. So I kind of got this like that's nickname amazing. is Athens. Um, so that's how that started. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I just decided on Instagram and YouTube to just keep it all the same and start just kind of recording videos about amazing. space, like stuff I learned in class, things I thought were cool. Um, and so that was already going for about a year and a half, I'd say, before making the move to L.A., meeting tomorrow's show, it's going on Seeker mm -hmm. and Futurism. And that's kind of how Amazing. all that grew. That is so cool. Oh. So social media was the start. So social media as a platform kind of enabled you to reach an audience and just put your voice out there and be like, hey, this is what I'm excited about. I want to share this with the world. Um, and then you slowly built up that that profile as, as a result of that. That is that's such a cool story because, you know, we talk to creatives of all different um, you know, backgrounds. And it's been amazing to hear how social media has enabled people to kind of build their own profiles and to really be in control of their own identity mm -hmm. and the products that they're putting out there. You're not relying on, you know, the old gatekeepers. You don't have to right. get a spot on network television in order to be successful. You can literally build your entire, mm -hmm. you know, um, empire yourself. Right. And that's, it's so cool to hear that that was kind of how, how it, it started for you as well. Do you, do you still feel like social media is, is kind of the, yeah. the biggest part of your uh, outreach um, for, to, to reach your audience? Yeah, definitely. Um, now it's become my biggest part. It, it really was a beta test at first, uh, just to sort of see if I can even sort of have, I guess, kind of like a on camera presence. Like, I mean, I've always like loved the arts, but like, so as far as acting and being on stage, but um, I was really nervous to talk in front of people. Um, I used to kind of just, I don't know, pronounce things weird and uh, didn't really have an expansive vocabulary. And so before even social media, I started volunteering at science museums. So I used to volunteer at the Intrepid in New York City, um, where the spacecraft. Oh, where, I was love the Intrepid. Yeah, right where the space shuttle Enterprise is, the the orbiter. Um, Such so a cool museum. It's amazing. We still have to all go together. I, I think that would be so much fun. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Um, oh, I love biking up and down the Hudson River Greenway past the Intrepid <laughs> too. Such a beautiful ride. I was yeah. just there the other night. It's looking beautiful. <laughs> it's so nice. Yeah. Like the bike path and everything. And they have so many aircraft there. Mm -hmm. Um, and they pre COVID, I'm yeah. sure post COVID they're going to do so many events. Um, even in the, the space shuttle mm -hmm. pavilion, they'd host like, um, yeah. uh, Astro cafe and like really cool things. Um, so, so I really kind of got started so volunteering excited. there. Once I like decided to kind of stem away from the research and go more into presentation, I was like, let me see if I really can hold a presence with a crowd and i figured that was the best way because we were getting anywhere from like yeah like two to five hundred people during my shift um of all ages adults mm -hmm. that you know or veterans uh, retired veterans um veterans and then like also uh, a lot of children school groups so it was like really yeah. the best beta test to see kind of what it'd be like yeah that place is always packed out um yeah. in the summertime especially and it's such a cool museum because it's so huge. The Intrepid is so much bigger on the inside than you really feel it is. I know. It feels like a TARDIS yeah. where you just like step inside and you're like, this is 
is this really this big? Yeah. <laughs> um, and then you have like the fact that there's the blackbird up there. The yeah, whole reason that Area 51 blackbird. exists. Like that's so cool. I love <laughs> to me. it. Um, and then of course the USS uh, Enterprise. Like that's amazing. They had the Concorde up there for a while too. I think that's still up there It's still too. there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The Concorde is epic. Um, and there was submarine. Um, they have so many things. Mm -hmm. They had a drone exhibit for a while. The Growler, yeah. <laughs> Although I always get like a little claustrophobic <laughs> and like kind of seasick when I'm on it because it's like bit, the yeah. top submerged. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I am so in love with that museum. Same. We're definitely going to do a trip. <laughs> Absolutely. We're going to have to take fun time program on the road. We'll do we'll do outdoor excursions. I love it. It's a whole new whole new idea for the show. <laughs> yeah. So one of the reasons we were so excited to talk to you today mm -hmm. is because you put out this amazing video uh, on YouTube, um, what space missions are coming up in 2021. And you also did a really awesome 60 second version of it. So if anybody is super ADD and is living in that TikTok world where they don't do more <laughs> than 60 seconds, go check it out. <laughs> What's upcoming space missions in 2021. Uh, we are so excited to talk about these missions because we're going to be doing shows on them over the course of the year. Mm -hmm. So it's like, let's get everything out of the way and let's talk about what's coming up and why we're excited for it. What's so, down the so line? Why, why don't you take us away with, with Mars? What is happening on Mars in February? It's like, oh my God, all of a sudden everything is like, we have three Mars missions arriving at this, not quite the same time, but in the same month. It's like Mars is a happening place right now. I love yeah. it. Like it's such a happening place that you get to take your pick of like which one of the missions you want to talk about first. Like, oh, well, let's like <laughs> let's dive into my favorite first. Yeah. Isn't that a luxury? I absolutely love that. It, it's like we're literally living at a time where there are so many missions and all over the world internationally, like so many nations are taking part in actually like space exploration, going to the moon, going to Mars. The moon is also a super happening place up and coming. Um, not only because of <laughs> yeah. like, yeah, not only because of like what NASA is doing with Artemis, which we'll definitely get into, but because they have a program that's now allowing like small businesses around the world to actually take part in having a presence on the moon. But we'll, we'll get into that later. We're going to, right. we'll talk about Mars first. Yes. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. It's so expensive. <laughs> um, so, so many things. <laughs> I know. So the Mars 2020 rover, also known as Perseverance, uh, through NASA is arriving sometime mid-February. I completely forgot what the date was. Sometime mid-February. And um, this is the first time a helicopter is going to be going to Mars. So it's, it comes with ingenuity. They're both arriving. I know. So cool. So there's um, yeah. the Perseverance rover and then the Ingenuity helicopter. And this is going to be extremely important because if you're like the rover and you have a camera and you're like, you know, driving along, you got all these hills and rocks and stuff. Sometimes you can't really see how far away, like um, an upcoming hill is, how deep it might be, um, mm -hmm. and so you don't want to like really drive full force with the rover ahead, and then you're, you know you crash into it. So the the helicopter right. is going to operate where it's going to be able to go ahead, you know, kind of like a drone, give you like a 360 view of that area, the terrain, and then you can continue exploring. So this is going to allow us to go even so it's further. The eyes of the rover. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. Well, That's yeah. so cool. I love that so much. Because huh. isn't that what happened? Um, the uh, lander that they had on, that they landed on the asteroid, um, that basically went dark because it was no longer able to face the sun. But if they had had something like this, where they could have had a rover move it to be in the sun and out of this little like... Was that Bennu, Asteroid Bennu? Asteroid Bennu. I think that's the mission you're thinking about. Yeah, I don't exactly remember what yeah. happened, but if it wasn't in the sun, it might have been like maybe a solar panel problem. So it couldn't charge its batteries and maybe the backup of yeah, the, it of the battery was batteries. Dead. I'm Basically, pretty sure what happened was it, it bounced, you know, in unpredictable ways when it hit the asteroid. Yeah. And they had to be so careful because the asteroid has such low gravity that if it bounced too, too hard, it would yeah. just bounce off and back into into space. But it ended up landing, I think, in a crevice where it didn't it didn't have enough light and, and it wasn't able to to do its mission for as long as they had hoped, but they still got great stuff mm -hmm. off there of that. Was, yeah. Yeah, that. There was, there yeah, there there was like a, a collection of the asteroid, I believe, for that one. Because also mm -hmm. Hayabusa 2 from Japan, um, so JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, they retrieved a sample of an asteroid. I don't remember which asteroid it was, but that was the first, I believe, asteroid sample to have been uh, retrieved and then successfully come back to Earth. And that was last month. Um, Just recently. So, yeah. Yeah. Right. Super so recent. Cool. Yeah. That's yeah. So I so think Bennu, cool. Yeah. 
Super, super cool. So yeah, so many things. And then also awesome. so the other missions. Oh, okay. Were you going to go into asteroid mining? Well, yeah, I was just, I, I want to talk about this helicopter a little bit more. I, yeah. I'm blown away by yeah, the- Yeah, I, the- I was going to say like everything about this. So uh, what, like the fact that there's being a, a helicopter being landed with the rover is already a huge thing because, you know, we have never seen a helicopter style spacecraft really. Never. That I know of. No. Yeah. This is, this is brand new. Yeah. This yeah. is so cool. This is like next level. But what's so crazy, I mean, just, just for people at home who maybe don't know enough about a ton about Mars, one of the uh, interesting things about Mars is that it has a very weak atmosphere. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's like a percentages of the pressure that we have here on Earth. So there's fewer molecules to push off of with a helicopter. So you need to have these giant wings and you need to be super lightweight because, I mean, it's, it's so funny. Uh, what the, the famous movie, The Martian, was well known for being super scientifically accurate, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody kind of lauded it for being, you know, really getting the science right. And the one thing that they got wrong in that movie. And, and Andy Weir even admits to this. He's like, I knew that this wasn't realistic, but it was kind of a plot point that he needed for the development of the plot. Was at the beginning of the movie, there's this huge sandstorm, right? And it blows over some tower. Right. And, and every well, uh, scientists who know about Mars are like, yeah, that, that would never happen because the wind, there isn't enough like wind. Yeah. You know, the wind can be going really fast, but there's not enough like energy behind it or not, not enough like, you know, weight to the wind to be able to knock things over. So how does a helicopter fly on Mars? Like, yeah. like what is this? Like, how does it charge? Does it go up? Does it come back and charge? Like what, how is this going to work? Do you know? Yeah. So um, I actually did a, a little experiment with some students I work with at um, a school I teach at called Dexter. And um, it's a super cool <laughs> STEM school. It's, you know, the name is Dexter. Um, and we did a little experiment actually. Yeah. <laughs> where we like um, made little helicopters with propellers and we essentially recreated what it would be like to really have um a helicopter, but that, you know, we're here on earth. So we kind of just dropped it, but we were kind of testing out the different, like what you were saying, um, John, about the sizes of, of the, of the propellants of the propellers and, um, just what the material would need to be like, how fast it would need to spin as well. Um, so that was something mm. that we were looking at too, but yeah, this helicopter is going to, I forgot what, um, the rotations per minute are, but I know that it's going to be spinning like extremely fast in order to really, gain enough um enough height and then also to continue i don't exactly remember how it charges its battery um it, i i believe it, there's a way that it maybe can reconnect with the rover itself and then like work off of that energy but i don't know for sure um because i know that the rover the perseverance rover is kind of like a similar design to curiosity um and other previous rovers mm-hmm. um opportunity as well it just has some new um materials added to it like moxie uh, which is able to convert carbon mm-hmm. dioxide, dark carbon dioxide into oxygen. Really important thing on Mars. So cool. If we want humans there. That's yeah. So, cool. so they're testing that out. So that's wow. part of the Perseverance rover, uh, which is really cool. But they're they're pretty similar in design. Like they all kind of look quite similar. Um, so I believe it's it's about the same type of charge as the previous rovers. Um, but the helicopter, I think what we should totally look into as far as how it's charged. I don't exactly remember. But regardless, super okay. exciting mission. I can't wait to, to see what images it brings back. I just I just can't wrap my head around the the hubris of these engineers because when you <laughs> when you when you look at the past Mars rover missions I don't remember which one it was but I, I remember uh, listening to the description of how they landed this rover by by having a rocket come down the rocket had to hover it had to release something it had to bounce in just the right ways and then things had like so many things have to go perfect for it's this so thing to work <laughs> yeah and they're killing it on mars like the nasa has just been one mission after another success which is really funny because nobody else has had any success on mars the russians have been trying to land rovers on mars and every single one has failed and you yeah. know we've had problems on venus where where russians have have had success and this helicopter to me just seems like okay we've been really successful with these absolutely crazy projects that we've you know managed to do in the past so let's kick it up a notch and make it even more ridiculously hard because it's like a helicopter flying around, like yeah. it's going to go fly and it's going to come back and charge. Like the level of complexity that has to, to all come together perfectly for this to work especially, is insane. Especially calculating the atmosphere and gravity on a different planet right? and having to calculate, having to fly on a different gravity scale. Yeah. You know, all these things that have to come together for this to work. I mean, they're they're tempting fate a little bit. I, th- I feel like they're. <laughs> yeah, I, I just think this is brilliant. This is just a feat of engineering. Yeah, if it works, we'll see. Exactly, <laughs> and also at the same time, there's um, the Insight Lander, which is currently on Mars, and that's measuring Mars quakes. 
So Mars has quakes, just like we have earthquakes mm-hmm. here on Earth. And so that's right. been like, you know, kind of has like a really small, kind of small kind of drill that's got into a bit of the crust and it's able to measure at least like some of the mm-hmm. tectonic activity um, on Mars. So we've got like all this whole robotic family on Mars, just like totally yeah, dominating amazing. it. Yeah, it's super, super it's cool. It's amazing. And they've got orbiters that are communicating with the robots on the ground. And it's like, yeah, I mean, yeah that's there. another one too. We, we have our robots have settled Mars. It feels like. Yeah, yeah. Now, <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, Mars is the robot planet currently. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and then uh, another one that you mentioned, Orbiter, um, the Hope Orbiter through United Arab Emirates. That's mm-hmm. also going to be arriving. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe it's sometime the end of this month or it's early March, but it's right on that cusp of February. So kind of we kind of grouped it together in the February missions, but um, that, that's I believe the first time that United Arab Emirates is going to be going to Mars. Um, so it is just going to be an, yeah, or, an orbiter. They have big plans for Mars, don't they? They talked about building a Martian city test city here on Earth. Do you know if that's still in, in happening? I remember reading about that. That was such I've an read interesting about it project. As well, yeah, I don't know what the current status is on that. Um, but they, in a, in, a, in addition to um, a few other uh, countries that are actually working on having like a whole Mars city, people that are working on. Um, I try to stray more away from the term colonization, <laughs> and I'll kind of look at like more like <laughs> habitats or like um, settled mm-hmm. like more like right. domes, uh, but uh, or like bases, so like lunar base, Mars bases, because that is something that they're that I know they're looking at as well for having. Um, there's actually a, a few companies yeah. too from France that are going to be using like silica aerogel to try to help create sort of this like greenhouse effect around some of their domes. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this wow. like really cool material, silica aerogel. No, not. No. I mean, not outside of like video games. Yeah, um, <laughs> I've seen it in uh, Subnautica, but I haven't seen it in real life. Okay, it's a super cool <laughs> material um, that is. It's like m- the majority of it is air, um, but it is essentially creating mm-hmm. this greenhouse effect. And it was made by Harvard scientists and researchers at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And I was able to hold it once. It's super lightweight. It's just like a little Wait, cube. actually, I have seen this. You've I have seen, it. seen this. It's crazy looking. Looks like it a cloud. Looks like a cloud on yeah. your hand. Yeah, no, I have seen this. Oh my God. I like it was one of the things that popped up on like this list of like really cool like science gifts to get your kids or something. And I was like, Well, you can buy it. Like, yeah, Wait, you, you can, can buy actually it? buy this shit. <laughs> You can, like, you can't buy very much of it. And it's like, yeah. of course, very pricey, but like, it's super cool. And it just looks insane. We need to get some for the studio. Yeah, it'd be super <laughs> So they're cool. using this for habitats? So that's, that's a goal for some companies that are like essentially working on it is incorporating that with a bunch of other materials. But what's so great about it is it's super lightweight, which is good for payload. You know, when you're launching there, you're having like a an eight month mission to get to Mars. Right. You don't want to have like too much stuff. So you want to have as, as light of a payload as possible. But something cool about it is that mm-hmm. um, it will trap in su- sunlight and heat. And so essentially creating a greenhouse effect. Oh, and that yeah. on Mars is really, really important because it's super duper cold on Mars. And um, because like you were Absolutely. mentioning, John, the atmosphere is super thin. So to have something essentially create that, it'll allow for plant life and humans to be able to live in yeah. and, and hold, trap in oxygen. And something pretty too is it diffracts light. So if um, I, I got to play with it, I, I do a YouTube video of it. But if you have like a flashlight and you shine it through it, it actually creates kind of like a sunset. So we would be able to oh. also see a nice sunset on Mars. Yeah, which would be cool. So like a prism. Oh my God, that's yeah. so cool. Yeah. That is amazing. Yeah, it's super <laughs> awesome. Science is so dope. I know. The way that we have progressed in science is so amazing. That's yeah. so cool. Yeah. So tell us more about the, the UAE mission. Do you know what their what their mission plan, uh, like uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, goals are? <laughs> Yeah, so it's mainly going to be essentially looking at the atmosphere on Mars. So I'm um, trying to kind of answer questions around like, um, so the planet hemorrhages hydrogen and helium, quite a lot of hydrogen and helium. So trying to sort of mm-hmm. understand like, you know, what aids in that process, like why is there such a, a prominent um, amount of that with not only within the atmosphere, but like just found also throughout the planet because um, the planet has ice caps um, on like, kind of like in the mm-hmm. South Pole and and uh, there's been some. Are they water so, ice? So it's a combination of, um, I believe it's ammonia, mm. carbon dioxide, mainly carbon dioxide. Um, but because there's so much carbon dioxide in the ice, it's carbon dioxide ice. 
um, researchers like well, Carl Sagan once actually said, he's like, I, I bet if we were to try to melt those ice caps, it would produce enough carbon dioxide to help think in the, thicken the atmosphere and possibly make it a little more relatable to Earth. The only problem Wasn't with that, that Elon Musk's did Elon say that too for, for terraforming Mars? His crazy idea, he went on some talk show and he's like, Yeah, all we have to do is drop a couple nukes on the on the polar ice caps and we'll have a greenhouse effect. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's the thing. The only <laughs> I don't know problem if he's serious. Is it wouldn't be long term. We'd have to come up with something else to sort of keep sustaining this atmosphere because right, Mars be doesn't temporary. have yeah. exactly, exactly. It doesn't have a magnetic field anymore. So that's how the atmosphere has escaped. Right. And so um, the magnetic field, which essentially is just created by like, you know, a charged circuit of, of um, energy going through the center of Earth and it comes through the poles. And then that's what you see swirling kind of around Earth. And when that interferes with the sun, mm-hmm. um, that's what creates like Aurora Borealis um, or um, yes. uh, what's the other name for those things? Um, the Northern Lights. Northern, Northern Lights. Lights. Thank you. So the Aurora, I was so yes. used to saying Aurora Borealis. Um, and so, so yeah, so that, that's kind of, 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 uh, of, um, going off subject a little bit, but yeah. So, so United Arab Emirates is looking to sort of get, gather some more information on like what is left of that Martian atmosphere and kind of understand it a bit more, um, which yeah, would, would of course aid in what their, their mission is their goal for possibly building up a city. So we'll see. I definitely want to look into that. Though. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. So what are the Chinese up to? They're so, landing a rover as well, right? Yeah, the the Taiwan One mission. Um, so something that they're kind of looking right. at as well. So a lot of um, a, a lot of the missions that are going to Mars are to try to find any type of signs of life, if there is any life there. Mm-hmm. Um, and when we when we say life too, like life on Mars, we're kind of thinking along the terms of like extremophiles. So like, you know, like how tardigrades, right. yeah, they can, they can survive. Yeah. Insane. I was just going to say tardigrades. Yeah, yeah. It's so insane. I mean, they, I think the, the little water bears, they are the coolest little thing. They're so <laughs> I'm cute. obsessed with tardigrades. And they could, they could survive in the vacuum of space. They brought them up to the space station and yeah. we're able to test that out, which is insane. So with that being said, like, right. are we going to find more like water bears or something, on, you know, something like it on Mars? Um, so that that's definitely something also that that um, China is going to be looking at on the Taiwan One mission. So Taiwan One, um, and so they're going to be looking at, for that as well. It's like it's a different like yeah um, locations. I think they're I, I forgot what part of Mars they're exploring, um, but trying to sort of just like collect different samples. I believe they're doing a sample return mission as well to Earth, just to do some more analysis on that. But from Mars, um, I believe so. I'm not. I, don't quote me on that. I'm actually not too sure about that. But I'll, I think a lot okay. of these missions. Something great about it is that um, a lot of the samples that are like collected with some of the rovers, there's a lot of Mm -hmm. uh, instruments built into these rovers to actually analyze it there uh, without having to return it. But I I feel like I thought, I don't know if it was Taiwan one, we can look into it afterwards or another mission that China's planning to do to do a return mission. It might be, it might be a moon mission, a lunar mission, because I know they're going to be sending more rovers there as well. Yeah. Moon's a little easier to get off of. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Yep, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that is that is so cool. So cool. So that's coming up already in February. And then you've got uh, the next mission that we're super excited to talk about, how NASA is extending Juno. We have been in yes. love with Juno. What did I name after Juno? I think I, na- I name all my devices off of like space probes or planets or, or moons or whatever. That. I think I named my phone Juno recently one of my one of my recent phones was named juno <gasps> juno is the coolest it's this orbiter that nasa sent to jupiter right and it's been yeah. orbiting jupiter it's been taking pictures of jupiter it's been doing science missions where it, it measures things it's been checking out the moons around jupiter and it was scheduled to be crash landed into jupiter in june i believe to, for the end of life because one of the one of the big priorities of nasa in our search for life in our solar system is that we don't want to accidentally bring it there So, Mm -hmm. so we make sure that we clean every rover, everything that goes and visits another planet is super clean, super sterilized, but we're still paranoid. So when they send uh, something like uh, an orbiter to, to Jupiter, they were like, well, we don't want to just end of life, let it continue orbiting and we lose track of it. We don't know what happens to it. Maybe it crash lands on, on a moon there and, 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 
brings life there. And then we discover life. And we're like, oh, wait, that's just life that we brought there. So they were going to crash land it into Jupiter um, to, to protect from that. And then they just recently announced, wait, we're not going to do that. We're going to extend the mission and do some more science. What what was the motivation for that? Do you know? Like, what are they getting out of this extension of the mission? Yeah. Well, one big thing, as you mentioned, is, is looking more at the moons. I mean, Jupiter has 79 moons 79 like there are so oh many God. moons like it's i think that that's There's such so a, many moons yeah it's such an exciting thing i think especially like talking to like little kiddos about this because they think like the moon and they just think the moon like earth's moon like one but satellite singular yeah <laughs> yeah but there are so many moons and a lot of these moons are similar to earth like in size a lot of them mm-hmm. have water Okay, like Europa. Europa! Yes, yes. <laughs> Water under its icy crust, which is just so exciting. Um, and, and actually, to, to backtrack a little bit in time at the Cassini mission, which was at Saturn, it mm-hmm. flew through water yeah. plumes that shoot out from the base of yeah. one of the moons of, um, of Enceladus. And it flew through that. And so, like, you know, when you think about these things, you're like, oh my gosh, like all this time we've been looking for life on planets, but there probably, there could possibly be life on these moons. And so it's really exciting that they're extending this mission um, with Juno, because like to be able to gather just more like just data and images and insight of, of these moons, I think that that can really, um, I should just give us a different perspective of our very own solar system. We're constantly, Mm -hmm. we've become Mm -hmm. like very obsessed with looking for exoplanets because, well, exoplanets are exciting. When TRAPPIST-1 was announced, you know, of having like, three right. planets in the Goldilocks zone. I mean, that that's an exciting thing, by the way, that means that's that so cool. in there, that's in the, so cool. Yeah. They're within range where there could possibly be life as we know it, biological life here on earth that could mm-hmm. possibly exist. Because Liquid it's, water. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly liquid water. Um, thank you. Yeah. Habitability. I'll, I'll stick with that <laughs> habitability. Um, and so, yeah, yeah. potential, <laughs> potential. It's always the, always, the, always the, the key word. Um, so that, that's, what's like super exciting about, about the Juno mission. It's, yeah. I remember as well when it launched, um, actually Scott Bolton gave a talk at the Intrepid, uh, which is really cool. I got to catch that, which is really awesome. Um, he's the, the head of the mission. Yeah. So I can't wait. Um, and the beautiful images, it, it, brings back of like the storms on Jupiter. I mean, yeah. oh, come on. Yeah. So great. And angles. I mean, we've seen, right? we've seen angles of Jupiter as a result of this mission that we had never seen before. It's, it's unbelievable to, mm-hmm. to, I mean, Jupiter is just such an incredible and important planet in our solar system. The more we learn about our solar system, the more we recognize how Jupiter is kind of this big protector that has enabled, um, you know, asteroid bombardment on Earth to be minimal in the last uh, several billion years, which we think is critical for life to having been able to uh, arise and thrive here. Um, And yeah, I mean, we can still witness today asteroids crashing into Jupiter. You know, we've, we've seen pictures from here on earth of it but so now we have this 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 orbiter there that's that's really getting a, an up close and personal look at jupiter it's been so inspiring to watch that um what do you know which moons in particular were interested in in terms of potential life on on jupiter i know it's it's europa and, and ganymede i think are the two big ones right yeah ganymede's another really big one um i think that the the main thing is what was collected from i forgot which mission it was at first gathered some of these. It might've been like when, when Voyager was doing a flyby, it really got like a, a good close up of, mm-hmm. of some of these, um, these moons, but yeah, those are kind of the two main ones that stick out. Um, Titan's a really interesting moon as well, but, but we're going to, we'll, we'll shift to that a little bit later. We're going to stick to th- these two, but I think <laughs> that, um, uh, yeah, Europa is, is something that I think Hopefully Juno will be able to gather just so much more like insight for Europa. Um, but also too, like, you know, th- the formation of these moons, their orbits is something really important too, because, you know, from our understanding, Jupiter was likely the first planet that formed in our solar system. It's the biggest one as well. And so that means that it's, mm-hmm. you know, extremely old. I mean, everything, a lot of the planets essentially formed right around the same time, but with Jupiter, Um, I just feel like, you know, the way that it's moons didn't get blown apart, like most of the other like accretion disks, which tend to form, um, like Mm -hmm. formed around the sun when the sun first formed, but then also around all the planets, usually what's remaining would be something that's tied together by a gravitational effect, um, of both planets. Mm -hmm. But the fact that a lot of these moons stayed around, I think that there's a lot 
to to still explore there because you know like we said like a lot a lot of the terrestrial planets meaning like mercury venus earth and mars the ones closer to earth they only have a couple of moons each and so we're on and the earth only right. has one moon and so i think that that just personally i think that's such a fascinating thing to even like think about um to to, to sort of explore yeah. that I, um and and how they're still in orbit are, are they coming closer to potentially a, like a type of collision course mm-hmm. maybe you also too so they can keep in mind the asteroid belt is located between mm-hmm. mars and jupiter and the reason we tend to get right. asteroids you know, possibly towards the inner solar system nearby Earth is because mm-hmm. Jupiter slingshots them from Jupiter's gravitational yeah. effect. And so it'll literally create a slingshot effect and it can throw a, an asteroid like off its trajectory and it can head towards, I'm just grabbing my lip balm, um, <laughs> towards, you know, <laughs> the inner solar system. So I think that that's something extremely important to keep Juno around too for for like, you know, pl- like planetary protection for, for asteroid redirect yes. missions as well. Watching oh, wow. the asteroids. Wow. Oh, I didn't realize that. That's so interesting. I think, you know, asteroid um, awareness, uh, th- we don't do enough. There isn't enough um, uh, motivation yet to, to really be developing the systems to be able to identify these, you know, potentially Earth killer asteroids that could show up out of nowhere that we haven't recognized yet. And and hopefully that's something that we get a jump on in the next, you know, several decades, because I think that that's super important for the longevity of humanity to develop a defense system that we can really keep an eye out for these kind of things. I don't know if you're a fan. You must be a fan of the show, The Expanse. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yep. <laughs> yes. 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 And the, the cool thing about The Expanse is that, you know, they really they show life in the solar system in, you know, maybe let's say 150 years. This could be realistic. I don't know, somewhere in that time frame. So near future where human beings have sort of settled the solar system and the asteroid belt is one of the three big kind of settlement areas. You have Earth, you have Mars, and then you have the belt, they between, call them, which is kind of like the outsiders that are out there in the fringes. And, and you know, they get to explore the different ways that life could or that human life and, and culture could evolve in those areas. And it's so fun to see how, you know, asteroids potentially crashing into Earth becomes a big plot point at some point in the show. And mm-hmm. and that's something that's very real today, you know, and mm-hmm. that's the main reason Elon Musk is so adamant about getting to Mars and getting a self-sustaining civilization on Mars is so that, you know, we don't have all our eggs in one basket, so to speak. So it's cool to, to hear that that NASA is thinking about that, you know, that, that that's a potential for Juno to be able to keep an eye on that kind of stuff. But we definitely need more. We need more eyes in the sky. Yeah. Uh, you know, looking for this kind of stuff that is so cool yeah june 30th is asteroid day as well so that was i think that was created okay, by a, cool. a lot of like graduate students at caltech i believe that was the university or it's university of colorado boulder but uh, they had come together and created asteroid day for really the that exactly what you said the awareness around like how frequent right. it is that the asteroids can come flinging mm-hmm. yeah. towards inner solar system um and you know keeping yeah. an eye out yeah, yeah. That that is amazing. Definitely worth keeping an eye on for sure. So yeah. we're gonna get a lot more exciting stuff coming out of Juno. We can't wait to see that. But speaking of keeping an eye on things, yes. there's the James Webb telescope. How excited are you for James Webb? <sighs> so excited. I mean, especially <laughs> too if it actually launches, hopefully, fingers crossed. Uh. On the 31st of October, that means it would be like a birthday present right. to me because my birthday is the next day. Oh, so. you're a Halloween baby. I, so that would just be super duper oh, that's cool. That's amazing. Yeah. So I really hope oh, it that's does. Extra cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, also just James Webb, like the mirrors are just like mm-hmm. beautiful. If you ever looked at, I mean, I'm sure you guys know all about it. I've seen the image as a honeycomb. Yeah. It's just yeah, it's super duper cool. Um, Gorgeous. And to backtrack a bit to like exoplanets, you know, that's a, that's a big target for James Webb now is, you know, really um, honing mm-hmm. in on on exploring exoplanetary systems, you know, looking at planets beyond our own solar <laughs> system. Um, and yeah, and, and, and kind of just exploring those worlds. Um, so I think that's going to be something I'm super excited about. I definitely hope it launches. Uh, back in, I think, 2016, I did actually bring up the Intrepid again. I did an interview um, with, uh, I re- interviewed one of the engineers for James Webb. Uh, she was working on it and they had this huge 
event. Um, I think it was, it was like NASA week or something like that. They do like the space and science festival there and NASA was there like all week. Mm -hmm. And so, um, they just kind of had all these NASA representatives walking around. So I got like this interview with, um, this oh, engineer. You um, wow. poor thing. It was oh, that must have been so terrible for you. I feel awful. <laughs> How do I sign up for this? Oh I'm my God. So upset. I wasn't there. Yeah, actually, you would have loved it, too, because they brought in a space camp was there and they brought a multi-axis trainer. So like a centrifuge. Yeah, a like trainer. And it was just so crazy. Um, I think I don't remember how many okay, G's it brought. That's you to. dope. It was so awesome. Yeah, oh, I'm so jealous. Yeah. So let's let's back up for a second, though. Why is James Webb so excited? Because we've yeah. had we've had Hubble for most of our life. Like right. what, like what's going to be the difference between the Hubble and the James Webb? Are they like putting like 4k cameras on it or something <laughs> like, is like what, what's going on for like people who have no idea what the difference is or because what's uh, important about it. Let's, let's just set the stage though, because Hubble has been, you know, this incredible eyes in the sky for, for our, well, our, our generation really, yeah. We're, you know, it, it, it was launched in our lifetime. And, and as a result, we've had these incredible pictures of space that, you even mentioned at the beginning of this interview, yeah. we're integral. Uh, is that the right word? <laughs> integral in in yeah. terms of uh, getting you to be inspired about space, because here we have these incredible pictures of galaxies far, far away. All of the, these nebulae and and, you know, looking back in time and our understanding, not just our understanding of space, but our visual excitement mm -hmm. for space, which is so important to inspire the future generations and inspire the public to continue funding space. So what wh why is James Webb being launched? Launched. How does it differ from Hubble and why is it exciting as, as sort of like a uh, next generation telescope? So uh, what you just said, a ne next generation telescope, I think that's kind of the key words right there of why this is so exciting, because it really is going to now be like the main go to telescope for gathering data and getting images um, that Hubble was for us when we were growing up. Um, Hubble also, mm -hmm. I believe it was actually going to be retiring soon and they extended it. But Hub Hubble mm -hmm. is, is approaching kind of its final final days. It, it's it's I think yeah. within the next maybe five-ish years, um, it's it's looking mm -hmm. to kind of coming to essentially coming to its, its end. So to have a new, like, you know, essentially massive camera in space, yeah. Having like a new, like, you know, kind of like having the new iPhone having a new fancy like space camera is it's, it's about ready, you know, it, it's about time. But in addition to that, um, like the, the James Webb space telescope is going to be taking like much like more in depth images. It's going to have like longer exposures. So it's going to be able to also take like a lot more images all at once. So it has these like separate compartments in it where it's going to be able to scan the sky in one region and take, I forgot what the exact number is compared to Hubble, but it's going to be like a really high exponential mm -hmm. amount of, of images. So what essentially that means mm -hmm. is when NASA or actually any of us could do this, anyone online who's listening who uh, has a background of photography or graphic design, NASA has raw images on their website on nasa.gov where you could actually download it and edit them yourselves. You can overlay images as well. They have a processor on there and you can learn essentially how to Ooh. process these images that we see by Hubble and like the Hubble Space Telescope books. And so with, with James Webb, we're now going to have, so essentially you're layering images on top of each other to get a really sharp image mm -hmm. of not only the depth of like a flat image like this, but also 3D models. Mm -hmm. So if you guys have ever seen, um, right, maybe like a cool, yeah, like visual YouTube, like in VR or something, video, yeah, um, oh yeah, virtual reality is gonna be a whole new thing too. So so just having more like mm -hmm. high def cameras, but having also more frames taken, frame like frames per second, mm -hmm. uh, being able to also track it. The mm -hmm. scope is gonna be moving with objects as as they're moving. Um, so essentially like wow. okay, compensating for that too, um, just like the time, like here on earth when mm -hmm. we have a telescope um, and we're pointing at like one direction, not only are things in between that moving, but earth is moving. So you constantly have to kind of correct for earth's motion. Track. So in yeah. space, it's a similar thing because the, the telescope is typically in like an orbit. So it'd be like, I believe it's at mm -hmm. Lagrange point one or two, which is kind of like an equilibrium of, of gravity. So it's kind of at like a balance point mm -hmm. uh, parking spot in space. And um, this telescope is going to be able to compensate for 
any type of movement. And when it does that, and it's going to be able to layer all these images on top of each other, it's going to be able to get, like I said, not only a more in-depth image, but also kind of this three-dimensional analysis of objects like galaxies and, and nebulae, um, but also to see like so much further out into the cosmos and then peering into exoplanetary systems. Um, it's going to be able to analyze parts of like atmospheric like changes or disturbances around like certain exoplanets. So a way right now that typically researchers are trying to figure out like what is present in the atmospheres of exoplanets is when they're peering out, actually I do, I do this example a lot. I'm going to just grab my ring light is if say like this light is um, a star and then something's passing in front of it. This is the transiting technique. Every time the light dips, yeah. most likely there's something that's passing in front of it, especially if there's like, uh, a mm -hmm. period or a recurring um, right. time period that every time it passes. If it's consistent. Yeah. And so if they're able to snap an image of this, measure what elements are present there through its spectral classifications, mm -hmm. then whatever passes in front, take an image of that. And then it'll measure, say, like, what's on my hand, what elements are there. And then they mm -hmm. would subtract whatever is present on that star and then be able to figure out essentially the composition of that planet. And so... Being able, wait, hold, let me just wait till I'm back on camera. Okay. <laughs> Being able to do that, I think it's going to be pretty exciting to to essentially figure out like, yeah, what, what these planets are composed of, what these atmospheres are composed of. Um, and like we were saying before, the potential habitability. Um, so, so yeah, James Webb is going to have a lot. James Webb has a lot more things too. I don't just don't remember right off the top of my head. But one thing for sure is just like the, the amount of depth that it's going to be able to receive is just going to be better than what we've even seen with Hubble. That's amazing. Oh, I can't wait. I have been excited about James Webb for years now. And it's it's one of these things. I, I'm the most opt optimistic person you'll meet. I don't get nervous. I don't worry about things. But when you look at the complexity, the first of all, the importance of this mission, we're talking the next generation Hubble that is going to be, you know, decades now of, of our life and a significant portion of our life where some of the most exciting, the potential for amazing science to happen. So, so something to get extremely excited about, but then you look at the complexity of the mission and I get freaking nervous. Do you, do you look at the, the, the complexity of this mission and, and sometimes be like, Oh man, I hope everything goes right. Or, or are you well, confident yeah. that we're just going to launch it out there to the Lagrange point one, everything's going to work out. Cause I mean, if you remember from Hubble, Hubble had some problems, right? There was like one of the rotating wheels on the thing broke. So it couldn't rotate and it couldn't focus. Right. And what do we do? We set up the space station, had a bunch of astronauts pop out and fix it and come back. You can't do that at Lagrange point one, at least with our current technology. I mean, I, granted SpaceX is killing it with Starship and maybe Starship will be able to get out there and fix stuff. But like if something goes wrong at any point in this mission, like we're talking about decades of potential incredible science down the drain. Like how do, how do you right. deal with the nerves on that? I mean, I'm, I'm freaking out over here. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, it's literally something the size of a school bus that's going to be deployed out just by like, like, fold, like folding outward. You know, it's going to be like this and then it's going to mm -hmm. go out in space. So yeah, like one thing could happen where a mirror is like, oh, sorry, can't really deploy all the way. I'm kind of stuck here. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things that can go wrong with it. Um, I guess like, yeah, like you were saying, is it's not going to be orbiting around Earth. So it's not like as if we can kind of just send people up there. But uh, I feel like sometimes through those, I guess, accidents or mishaps is when incredible discoveries are made. So an example is like what mm -hmm. you just said about Hubble. I don't know if you're aware, but like through that fix that NASA did where they got some of like their best computer software engineers to essentially fix the optic problem, the optical problem, the images came were coming mm -hmm. back blurry. They needed to sharpen it. They used that technology for right. mammograms to detect breast cancer earlier on in earlier stages. So they actually <sighs> applied that now to medical technology and, um, or at least in like the nineties and two thousands. But, um, so now, I mean, I think we're, we're far beyond that as far as technology goes and mammograms, but the point is like so many times through these like adventures and these like journeys into the unknown is when some of the biggest things that mm -hmm. can save lives here on earth um, is really when that happens. 
I think that that's something that I guess kind of comforts me because of course, yeah, like I can think, oh my God, this thing could launch. Maybe that's why it's been delayed so, so many, many things times. Can get wrong, yeah. 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 Um, Cause this thing has been delayed a lot. Like, I mean, so much. And so, yeah, yeah but of course they just want to, they want to make sure that like nothing goes wrong. And um, yeah, but, but there's, there's always that possibility and it would certainly be terrible. Um, but at the same time, it's, yeah. you know, kind of, it's, it's just worth, worth the risk at least you know um because again like there could be discoveries made from it that could completely change our lives that we wouldn't have even thought of if we didn't actually journey out into this unknown yeah yeah Yeah, it's amazing and it's amazing to see how they plan these missions you know when when they first started planning james webb the the space launch system didn't even exist yeah and it still still doesn't quite exist yeah that's that's been a thorn in our side for for a while now but in order for the space for the James Webb to even be able to be feasible, they need a rocket like the Space Launch System, which NASA hasn't had now since they retired the space shuttle. Even the space shuttle, I don't know if it would have been capable of, of launching this. And um, yeah, so so in order to be able to do this, they have to have this this separate program, the Space Launch System, being developed at the same time. Which now James Webb, it's, it seems like, is going to be waiting on um, SLS to, to complete in order to be ready to launch it. What is the status of of SLS of the Space Launch System? Um, I thought actually that James Webb was launching on an Ariane 5 rocket from Ariane Space. Oh my God, am I completely, Um, completely wrong here? (laughs) Let me double check because I'm pretty sure it's not supposed to launch on SLS. I believe it's supposed to, yeah, it's going to be launching on an Ariane 5 rocket. So, um, you are right. I uh, take that back. The only reason I actually know that is because I worked with that space agency for a bit covering launches for them. Um, they launch out of the Amazon in South America and French Guiana. Um, I got to go to other ones, which was insane. Wow. Oh my goodness. Oh, I can only imagine. It was so cool. Yeah. They like, um, so Ariane group, um, is the manufacturer for their launchers and they hosted their own kind of like round table show. We had a really awesome couch, like what you guys have and like a group of, of just like, yeah, like co-hosts and we had special guests on and essentially we're covering this rocket launch for, well, not the James Webb, but covering rocket launches for Ariane group. And, um, and so that's how I know that Ariane five is the, that rocket is what's going to be launching James Webb. So that rocket's already good Got to it. go. Um, it has a pretty good success rate. As that makes well. me feel so much better. Yeah. Right. Cause that was one of my big fears was we're taking this, this incredible new telescope, we're putting it on a new system and it's like, oh, gosh, that, oh. that, that, that's crazy, crazy. Okay. <laughs> so we're putting it on Ariane five, which is, which is a well-established system with a good success rate. <laughs> that that's one thing, one, one thing fewer then. thing to worry about. Oh my God. I feel so much better. Yeah. About it. So that means that we have a good chance of seeing this, this October 31st launch uh, for James Webb. So that is so exciting. We're going to have to throw a big virtual birthday party for you. Yes. <laughs> I hope so. I really hope it launches this date. I hope it doesn't keep getting pushed, but there's a chance that it will, unfortunately, but yeah. we'll see. Hopefully not. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's, there's it's a chance it won't. It's part of the game. Yeah. Part of the game. Got to be patient with space for sure. Let's talk about Artemis and SLS, the space launch system. You've mm-hmm. got this, you've got the shirt. We've been talking about SLS for years now and Artemis, Artemis is a fairly new program, isn't it? Yeah. So, the, well, the astronauts were just chosen for them for for the Artemis program. Um, mm-hmm. I think only a couple of months ago in December, I believe it was, um, and which is right. exciting because it's fifty percent women. First time women are going to the moon. Yay! Super exciting. I know. So so excited. Um, I would. It's actually incredible if you just Google like Artemis mission astronauts. So many of them are so young. They're like only like a year, a couple years yeah. older than me. Like some of them are in their early thirties. Um, yeah. So it's like super duper exciting. Um, but as far as the status of SLS, yeah, no, that's definitely something that's kind of uh, t- taken a bit of time, um, taken a while. Last time I was actually at Kennedy Space Center, which uh, was for the final SpaceX um, right before their Crew Dragon launch. So it was their final cargo launch, um, which was like the the Cargo mm-hmm. Dragon. It was CRS-20, which launched like, you know, like toilet paper and stuff. No, I'm just kidding. It was so much cooler than that. It launched like an Adidas, like uh, memory <laughs> foam to space and all this cool stuff like plants and everything. Um, really cool technology. Right. Is, and I'm sure there was some toilet paper. <laughs> some toilet paper. The astronauts needed some stuff. Um, so, uh, so when I was there, they were actually doing, um, they had just brought out, uh, I think it was like a part of the centerpiece of the first stage booster um, that they were testing. So kind of doing mm-hmm. maneuvers in and out of the facility. So, so, that's what I saw as far as the most recent um, 
update in person, but I believe they're, they're, um, they've, I think they've gone further than that. They've probably already gotten now at least like the main, like center part of the, of the booster, um, which is essentially just that part that actually will burn through the propellant. And then it's going to deploy, deploy, Mm -hmm. um, the Orion spacecraft, which is on top. So this top part separates, that's Mm going to then continue out into space, but, um, that bottom part will burn through its fuel and then, um, I don't believe they're planning to land it though, unfortunately, here on Earth. Like I feel I feel like yeah. we No, I no, I think you're right about that. It's it's sort of still the old space tech that is kind of been this is like the final iteration of of what has been well established rocket technology to just get stuff to space reliably, not worrying about cost. Um, you know, the cost of the SLS program, the cost of every launch for the rocket is just phenomenally higher than than what the new space companies are able to do with stuff like Starship, which obviously isn't isn't fully operational yet, but or even the Falcon 9, you know, the, this relanding of the rockets, because when SLS was first, you know, envisioned, this new landing technology just didn't exist yet. So <laughs> I feel like we've almost gotten spoiled by like, you know, what not only Elon Musk is doing with, you know, like obviously Falcon 9 has already landed. I think a hundred times now they've, they've landed their first stage booster yeah. and then um jeff bezos what they're doing with blue origin um you know the new shepherd yeah. which they're not planning to go too far i think yeah. the, well maybe new glenn there which has it they've never released any images of it just yet um as far as its development go but new shepherd will be bringing like tourists to space um but mm-hmm. backtracking mm-hmm. to sls yeah i think that um that's definitely something that is is certainly using like older technology, which is kind of like, you know, for all of us space geeks, we're like, oh, come on, come on, NASA, like get with the program, like let's develop something right. a little bit, you know, more, more uh, reusable, environmentally conscious kind of, you know, if you can be with rockets. Yeah. Um, but that's definitely <clears> going <throat> to be an exciting thing. And just like kind of my t-shirt says, the plan is to essentially head to the moon first and then eventually have it be sort of like this little stopover and then head on over to Mars. Mm-hmm which I think is, um, that's been my favorite plan, like way before I think it Mm -hmm. really kind of got set in stone. Um, when people were asking, Oh, do you choose Mars or or the moon? I always was kind of more for like, okay, let's head to the moon first. Let's make that kind of like a layover and then eventually head to Mars. Right. It just, I mean, it does just make sense as far as like, um, just getting things set up there and having our our Mm -hmm. robots start to already 3d print rockets for us on Mars, 3D prints right. things, um, get it all set up and ready on both places. So um, that's definitely yeah. definitely something that's going to be really exciting. I want to kind of mention, have you guys seen the spacesuits for the Artemis program and what they look like? No. I haven't looked at them yet. So, We're going to have to pull them up. We'll put them on screen. Yeah, definitely do. Um, so uh, me and my friends kind of have this like uh, ongoing joke about how funny they look <laughs> because it's just like so, oh, I wow. mean, of course... They're, they're, you know, EVA suits, which is extravehicular activity. So it went for outside the space station um, right. or out, like outside, essentially. So so radiation protection um, has the oxygen oh, tank wow. going through it. But you look at that and then you look at, you know, SpaceX's. So, it, it looks so big and bulky in comparison <laughs> to like a They're kind of cute. Moon. They should paint them all different colors and you could be like Teletubbies in oh space. Oh, my God. <laughs> That was another thing. The colors, it, 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 you know, it's just really, it's so funny. I, I totally get the patriotism, uh, you know, red, white, and blue. I was like, cool. Um, but it's yeah, just it's, so- it's sure. But like, or you could just have all of the astronauts' favorite colors and have the Care Bears in space. Oh my <laughs> gosh, that would just be so funny. Like, let the astronauts design their favorite, like, design their suits, have it be their creativity, how they like say hello to the world and make their mark on the world, right? Like. I just found it's not just NASA on, um, on NASA's <laughs> website. They call it Earth Blue, Rocket Red, and Lunar Silver. <laughs> that is, I can't help it. Rocket me. Red, I love it. I can just, I think, I think a big <laughs> idea behind this. Nobody's problem. worried about that reference to Red Rockets, like. <laughs> Oh my gosh! I just everybody's like, growing up with a dog. Come on now! <laughs> oh my so god, funny. this is hilarious. It's so, it's just so cute. I'm just imagining if they'll pop, they're probably gonna want to make like action figure dolls, and they just thought it would look really cool. Yeah, we're like, yeah, guys, we got this. I need Go to know NASA. who was on their fashion design team, right? I yeah. need to talk to them. <laughs> that would have been yeah. great, you know? Yeah, <laughs> for sure. But I mean, this. This really highlights sort of the different philosophies that that you know NASA has compared to some of these other uh, private um, 
corporations are, are able to take a very different philosophy to space exploration. It's amazing that, you know, people like Elon Musk have created SpaceX to, to you know, go at it from a different perspective because NASA is a very low uh, risk tolerance agency. You know, they're working with with public money. Um, you Everything has to be approved by Congress, which means that individual Congress men and women have uh, often outsized influence over the way that the spending is allocated, which often means that you have every district has, you know, something, some part of the rockets being built over here, some part over here, because that means that you are able to get support for it in Congress from a wide array of, of Congress people. Um, so yeah, I mean, it really highlights the difference where NASA needs to kind of go slow and be the tortoise in this game um, with, you know, a good budget, but that budget is all about zero risk. And then right, you see reliable. companies like like SpaceX coming in with with this new direction which is so exciting to see. So what the Artemis program is essentially the moon program, right? And and that means that we're we're hoping to establish a base on the moon. Um we're going to be using the space launch system to do it and then from there it'll be kind of uh NASA's next step to to start thinking about colon not colonizing, thinking about landing humans on Mars. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's so funny that 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 term colonization. I think it's just kind of got this like, you know, like just sort of bad rep which is kind of humanity in general like every time yeah. we kind of find new land we're like, "Oh, yeah. it's ours, man." And uh which is kind of right. ironic right. because there are like some crazy sort of conspiracy theories about like, well, I don't really know if it's really a conspiracy to be honest, but um, that humanity, what if maybe we actually had come from Mars and now we're like somehow going back? Because if you really think about how humans even formed here on Earth or how life formed, uh, there's a theory known as panspermia, which you guys maybe heard about, which talked about mm-hmm. maybe there being some type of like bacteria that was on a space rock that then collided on Earth. And that's what kind of like created life. And also that Mars Mm-hmm. Right around the time that Earth was becoming sort of this like habitable place, Mars was sort of dying out. It used to be a very wet planet that had water and, you know, potentially some type of, you know, atmosphere or something like that. So I just think it's kind of funny mm-hmm. that, that when, we, when I talk with people about that, sometimes we're like, yeah, it's kind of strange. But anyway, um, so, yes, <laughs> just, just had to throw that out there that it's kind of this just interesting thought. Um, but but with, right. with going back, um, for sure, I think that, you know, that with, with the Artemis program, um, and this is why, too, as you were saying, that like, you know, getting to the moon and then as far as get, getting then over to Mars, this is why I think public and private partnerships are so important. And this is why I think it was so exciting mm-hmm. what we saw with the Crew-1 Dragon capsule, um, you know, bringing NASA mm-hmm. astronauts to the ISS is having that partnership between a public and private entity, because exactly what you mentioned about spice, right. space policy is something that oftentimes gets in the way. You know, I mean, for one, it's always determined by the administration. And then secondly, after the, the NASA Transition Authorization Act is sort of put out there, then it's up to Congress and the senators. And then there'd be like lobbyists, like mm-hmm. I, I myself actually have gone with the Planetary Society to speak with Congress and, and um different senators um, about like why uh, certain programs should be funded, but it's always kind of this fight, you know, and like fight for this program right. to be funded. And um, that, that's what, what you were saying. There's so much more risk taking that's done with these private companies because of, you know, separate, separate uh, investment and separate raising capital. Um, but looking back at kind of like what, what you were saying with uh, the Artemis program, you know, sort of setting up, Camp, there's going to be a few missions for Artemis. So Artemis 1, uh, I believe there's a goal to launch towards the end of this year, which is going to be an uncrewed mission. So Artemis 1 is going to be heading to the moon, um, orbiting around, and then coming back. And then Artemis 2 is going to be going heading to the moon. I believe there's going to be a separation of um, uh, a communications uh, module or some type of lander that's going to then land on the moon. Um, start to probably collect data of some sort, and then that orbit is going to come and then go back to 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 Earth. And then by Artemis 3's mission is when they're planning to eventually launch humans and then head to the moon. But it, while that's happening, that's just the Artemis program in itself. Um, each of those missions are also carrying separate payload, commercial payload. So it's part of like the commercial mm-hmm. services payload program, mm-hmm. which... NASA started for other small businesses to take part in having a presence on the moon. So there are like small businesses, companies, um, all these other like uh, nations as well, international um, like uh, partners that don't have a space agency, but want to take a place on the moon are building their own landers. And so the Artemis Mm. one mission, there's actually going to be, if it's a successful mission, the very first 
um, non-governmental privately developed lander from a private company. Like if you and I made our own company wow. and we could create a lunar lander um, yeah. and essentially like uh, uh, apply to have our lander and probably pay NASA X amount of dollars to launch it to the moon, we can have our very own lander and our own presence on the moon. And so that's also something exciting with the wow. Artemis program is it's now kind of setting up camp for all these other nations and companies to start to launch their own stuff to the moon. In addition to wow. the countries that also have right. their own launches, like Russia um, is starting up their Luna program and they're going to be launching the new Luna 27 lander. I believe it was, it was either 27 or 26. Uh, that's going to be heading to the moon. And, um, and that hasn't been open or inactive since like 1976. And so Russia's space program starting wow. that up again. And then China is launching to the moon again as well. So yeah, there's, there's a lot that we're going to be seeing just in this year alone of more of a presence on the moon. Amazing. That's Amazing. So cool. A lot. <laughs> yeah. Do we know, do we have any indication yet on how the incoming Biden administration may affect uh, some of these goals for the Artemis mission? That is such a great question. I haven't actually taken the time yet to to look into what his policies are for NASA. Um, I think a important thing probably by, I think March, February, March is when they release the NASA Transition Authorization Act, super long name. Essentially, it's the step before the NASA bill is approved. And during that gotcha. time is when there's going to be a lot of companies, um, like as I mentioned, I, I took part with the Planetary Society. There's a few space companies that go to Capitol Hill and will talk directly like face to face with a couple of congressmen and women and senators about um, certain programs that we believe should be funded. And we just do that on our own. So mm. I probably won't be participating, obviously, because of COVID. But I know there are some groups doing it in D.C. Mm -hmm. um, this year. There's a few mm -hmm. of my friends already reached out to me about it. Um, and so that's, yeah, that I would be very interested to, to look into um, because that's going to be under the new administration, uh, the Biden administration. But I'm pretty sure already yeah. Biden has expressed uh, an increase in um, education. And something that we saw in the previous administration is the STEM mm -hmm. education dropped really low. I think it actually dropped down to 0% for under NASA. Um, and so it, it wow. dropped really, really low. Yeah. Most of it went into uh, defense, which is Space Force. Um, and so I bet, I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure we're going to be seeing a reverse of that. We're probably going to see a major decrease in the Space Force funding, a nice. major increase in STEM education. Um, and also, um, Earth and okay. Planetary also dropped uh, to, right. I think it was 0%, actually. I, I don't know for sure, but yeah. I'm pretty sure it was, I think it was completely depleted um, for, for funding for Earth and Planetary Research um, and Earth Science. As also, I know a lot of my friends went into study that, which is exactly which is climate science, which yep. the previous administration, unfortunately, was not very big on. Um, yeah. And hopefully we'll see a resurgence in that with, yeah. with the new administration. So we're, we're looking forward to March then to learning more about what, what the, the Biden administration's uh, plans are for NASA mm -hmm. and for these missions. Yeah, definitely. I, I'm definitely also hoping awesome. for an increase in NOAA, National uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric yeah. Association. So that's going to be really exciting. That's, right. Yeah. You know, it tells our weather. Right. Come on, go. It's our weather. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. And we've been learning that weather plays a pretty big role in, you know, uh, human well-being as well as e e economy. <laughs> yeah, you know, pe people look at it from different perspectives. There's there's like the, the human well-being side of, of, you know, the storms that cause, you know, devastation. But there's also the economic side of it. Mm -hmm. And some people care more about the economics and some people care more about the human well-being. But fortunately, if we can get them to work together, we can, you know, everybody can be excited about the idea that we should understand our weather better and our earth science is better and that it's important to fund it. So exactly. that'll be exciting to hear um, what comes out of, of the new uh, uh, transition authorization act. Did I get that right? Yes, you did. <laughs> awesome. Yay. So we're going to be covering that when that comes out. Let's talk a little bit more about these private uh, uh, companies that are getting, doing really exciting stuff in space. Um, I didn't have it here on the board, but you mentioned the, 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 the Starliner CRS and is that what is what is the the Boeing Starliner which is going to be the the second private company um, launching astronauts to the International Space Station SpaceX did it for the first time last year um, have we had two missions now I think we've had two missions now one was yes. the test mission and then they've had the second mission which was the first official crewed mission mm -hmm. to the International Space Station so that's running successfully and the reason that's so exciting is that um, we since the space shuttle uh, retired. 
almost a decade ago now, mm -hmm. uh, NASA has not had the capability to launch astronauts to the space station or to return them. Uh, and we've been relying on paid missions with the Russians. And we've not always been on, you know, the best, best, terms. best terms with the Russians. There were some moments when, during the Crimea um, uh, little period there where we were nervous about our ability to continue to send astronauts to the mm -hmm. space station. So it's so exciting that we now have that capability again, thanks to private companies like SpaceX. And now we're, we're talking about Boeing. Boeing has... Uh, Fallen behind a little bit, but potentially this year we're going to get our first crewed mission to the International Space Station from Boeing Starliner. Is that correct? Yeah. So the Boeing Starliner um, has, I think, it's been under development for for about five years now. It's been under development development for a while, mm -hmm. um, and it's going to operate um, along the same lines, essentially, really similarly to uh, the Crew Dragon, where it's you know it's a separate um, space capsule that's going to be docking to the ISS. And um, once that first mission happens, I think we're going to really be seeing a lot more of these launches happening with both like SpaceX and also um, Starliner. Uh, there's also going to be the first launch of private citizens to the, to the space station as well. Um, I heard about that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Is that on Starliner? I don't believe it's Starliner. Um, that's actually what I was trying to remember right now. Um, she wanted to look it up really quick because I actually completely forgot what it was going to launch on it. But I, I know it's part of SpaceX, but um, I, I, it might be part of Crew Dragon, but it might be another another space capsule. Um, but yeah, that, that's that's what's something that's also going to be happening with the space station as well um, is having people launch to space. Um, just yeah, like not NASA official trained astronauts, just like. Yeah, you know, I, I want to say kind of everyday people, but it's, yeah. Did, did you find it? I have the article here. We'll put it up on the screen. It's an American real estate investor, a Canadian investor, and a former Israeli Air Force pilot are paying $55 million each to be part of the first fully private astronaut crew to journey to the International Space Station. They will hitch a ride on SpaceX's Crew Dragon capsule early mm. next year, which is now this year, with a veteran NASA astronaut. So they're going as a part of uh, a company, a space tourism company called Axiom Space, uh, which has hired this NASA, NASA astronaut. Um, commander Michael Lopez Alegria, um, who has been there previously with NASA, and he's going to be um, flying this particular mission with these three private citizens who are going to be excited to get to check out the ISS. So that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Axiom Space has been talking about um, that for a while, like converting the ISS into a space hotel. Um, once, because like the right. ISS, yeah, there's been talks about it uh, essentially like, yeah, going going out of system, I guess, like kind of kind of not working, not like not operating anymore. So going out of operation, um, defunding right. it, defunding, defunding it essentially, because a huge percentage of the NASA budget goes towards keeping ISS running, and they're talking about you know uh, reallocating that budget to other exciting projects in the future. But that hasn't been officially announced yet. But I think it's currently funded through you know a few few more years towards the end of the decade, I believe. Yeah. Exactly. And so Axiom Space has already been kind of looking at this idea around like space tourism, space hotels. Um, so yeah, I'm glad you, you looked that up because I, I was like trying to find it in my article. But um, yeah, that, that's something that uh, is, yeah, it, like to, to me, I just feel like it's just gonna be so astonishing, even though like, you know, yeah, like you said, $55 million per person that are, are paying to do that um, is like insane. But I guess if you kind of think about it, it, it costs $81 million per seat on the Soyuz capsule um, that we were paying to have like right. our astronauts fly there. And so to have like a person, if there's like a way we could like, you know, someone can work out like a sponsorship or something like that. I almost wonder if that's something that um, right. more people hopefully one day will be able to do. Yeah, it's so cool. It's it's funny here because the, the this article on the Verge breaks down uh, what what they're paying for because you're not just paying for your seat on the rocket, but you're paying for eleven thousand two hundred fifty dollars per day to use the life support system on the International Space Station um, and the toilet. <laughs> it's an expensive toilet. <laughs> Twenty two thousand five hundred per day for all necessary crew supplies like food, air, medical supplies, and more. A forty two dollar per kilowatt hour for power. Because, you know, you want to be able to use power while you're there, electricity, yep. charge your phone so you can make sure you're tweeting. Uh, how, how else are you going to post it to in your Instagram? Exactly. <laughs> um, so that, that comes out to a nightly cost of about 35000 per person. So that's a big uh, a big part of, of, maybe not a big part, but it is a part of of that $55 million price tag. Um, I think that there was also a, a Wi-Fi or a, a data connection charge per gigabyte or something like that. So <laughs> yeah. your selfies that you're going to be sending home are going to be very expensive. So this is something that currently is only available to very, very wealthy, very wealthy people. But right. there are many people in the private sector who are really interested in bringing down the cost of space tourism. We have companies now like Virgin Galactic 
Blue Origin, and even SpaceX have have aspirations towards this. Let's talk about some of, of their, their goals for this year specifically, because it's easy to kind of forget about Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin because, you know, SpaceX tends to take up a lot of the oxygen in the room because of the stuff they're doing is so incredibly exciting. But here we have companies like Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin and also Axiom Space that are kind of, you know, plugging away in, in their own goals. So what, what are they up to this year that's, that's worth getting excited about? So Virgin Galactic um, is definitely a company that uh, is... Just, yeah, they've been having quite a few like successful launches of Spaceship Two, uh, which rides on White Knight. If any of you guys have ever seen one of those launches, uh, it's so cool. It's like essentially a giant double airplane that's connected. It's like two airplanes um, and in between them yeah, is, yeah. yeah, in between them is Spaceship Two. And so essentially it like heads really, really, really high up into the atmosphere and then Spaceship Two um, separates and then it heads all the way up into sub- suborbital flight. Um, and then it's your free fall for, uh, or you're, you're like in, in micro G for, I think it's about 30 seconds to 45 seconds. And then it heads back down to earth. Um, and so these missions, uh, are, I think really exciting. It's a lower price point. It's still pretty high. It's $250,000, um, per seat. But, um, I, you know, as you were mentioning, John, is that, you know, there's more companies doing this. And if we look at like, when uh, air travel first started becoming popular in the 1950s, the first flight um, with you know calculating an inflation, it was like a, a flight from Chicago to Phoenix. It cost about, I believe it was like 130, no, it was about $400. So modern day dollars, that would be just over a grand, that'd be about $1,300 for wow. a flight mm-hmm. from Chicago to Phoenix. That's not that terrible. And so, so now looking at how many years since then, right? So, um, Mm-hmm. If we were to predict that in the future, we're going to start to see prices really drop. Like originally flying on a, an airplane right. was like only for the very wealthy. It really dropped down in price because more right. airlines started coming out into operation. So I have hopes just for like that for the future, you know, for, for space flight, um, the more companies that will start doing this. Um, also, too, it's going to be um, essentially just building better technology. It's going to allow for them to kind mm-hmm. of work out like the kinks for them to sort of work out like any type of like. Right, because multiple companies um, are doing it. Exactly, exactly. Um, so that, that's something really exciting too. In addition to um, Blue Origin, what you were mentioning too, um, Jeff Bezos' company, what New Shepard. Uh, there just was the successful thirteenth launch of New Shepard, um, so test launch of that as well. And that's something too that would be bringing people up um, just high enough to sort of like catch like the curvature of Earth. Um, and then it would it would head back down. Mm-hmm. I think that's a higher price point. I believe that's around like a million or so um, for that launch. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, looking, looking at all of these um, and of course, even Elon, I mean, SpaceX is working on so many different projects just all at once. It's not like that they just have like that one rocket. They have so many projects happening. It's, it's phenomenal. Um, And so like there's Starship, there's Starship Luna. um, There is um, like, yeah, as as right now, as we're talking, SNA is being is in test right now. And then uh, I believe Starship Luna SN9. Yes. Sorry about SN9. that. SN9. Yep. Um, actually, are you, are you pulling it up right now? Are you going to see if it's... I am. I'm curious. Has it launched yet? Because literally, as we're talking right now, it's sitting on the pad, uh, getting ready to do its test flight. I am so And I don't see anything it. about it flying just yet. Oh. I'm not seeing anything just yet. Pull so up Tim Dodd here it. and see what he's up to. He's down there, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, that would just be so awesome. I'd love to see that um, in person. And it's funny, even... Um, Jeff Bezos, that's also out, uh, I forgot so which part of Texas, but you know, we've, we've got now like these two, two space companies in Texas, like co- coming back to the space homeland, right. you know, like we're, we're Houston, um, like Bring what's really the home of, yeah, like Apollo missions and everything. So, um, yeah, there, there's just like so much I, I think going on and happening right now. And, and I think a really important part of just, just personally, like what, what I am trying to do and what I am doing with um, even just speaking with you guys or speaking with, uh, like kiddos and, and my classes is just like talking to the youth and the younger generations right now that are seeing all of this happening. Like they're the ones who are going to be developing their own companies. They're the ones who are going to have an entrepreneurial mm-hmm. like mindset and motivation and inspiration. So I think create their own companies as well. Um, and I can only imagine yeah. what it's going to be like when we're like in our eighties, um, hopefully this continues. Hopefully I, yes. I actually don't even need to use the word hopefully to be honest, because like, it's not all reliant yeah, right. anymore on public. It, there's so much happening in the private sector yes. that this is what is 
really, I think, defining um, just our, our world of space exploration. So that's, yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. This past decade has been the most exciting and inspirational for seeing that transition happen from going from our childhood where we were kind of on the tail end, you know, it was like things were kind of dying down. There wasn't a whole lot of exciting stuff happening and it was happening at NASA's super slow, methodical pace. It was yep. harder to get excited about. And over the past decade, man, it's just like- Things have just been rapid. To the point where now, like you said, it doesn't require hope anymore. We, we can really look forward into the future be and be assured, excited yeah. about the fact that over the next decades in our lifetime, we're going to see some of the most incredible stuff happening in space. And this decade alone, you know, we, we, we might have boots on Mars. I'm so excited. By the end of this decade and almost definitely boots on the moon again. Yeah. You know, so there's there's so much exciting stuff happening. We have to talk a little bit more about Starship. Obviously. Uh, I have it here on the screen. Here's here's Tim Dodd. We'll, we'll get this blown up for everybody. It's sitting there on the launch pad. There's rumors of another scrub today. So so oh. it, it may not go off today. But but what is so exciting about what they're doing with Starship down here in Boca Chica, Texas? I mean, they're building this, this they, they literally just like, rocket, rocket development has always kind of happened behind closed doors, right? Mm -hmm. They don't want to talk about their testing and like maybe something didn't go right, right? Ever. They show you when it works. Here is SpaceX. They just send a bunch of engineers down to this middle of nowhere, Boca Chica, Texas, and they just start building these water towers yeah. out for everybody to see. And then they start strapping rockets to these water towers, shooting them up in the air, crash landing them, trying this, trying that. What the heck are they doing? And it feels like a billionaire just kind of playing around with his money. Is this a serious venture? And, and why should we be excited about it? Yeah, it's so funny that you put it that way because it feels almost like everybody has gone from the space coast to Texas. You know, it's like there's just so much. Um, and I think the only mm -hmm. person who used to actually be out there doing the coverage of these water tank hops um, literally was Lab Padre, uh, which is a great YouTube channel. They always have a 24 hour <laughs> podcast, or 24 hour live stream going. They just have their camera set up and just keep mm -hmm. it going. Um, so that was really my go-to source for a while of what Starship was up to. But um, for one, like Elon's even said it about Starship, like the re reason he went with stainless steel, um, not only because it has a really, really high melting point, it's cheaper than carbon fiber, but it looks cool. It looks futuristic. It reminds yeah. him of just yeah. like old sci-fi. And, and because of that, like yes. that's what's, I think just, yeah, like you were saying, is it just like a billionaire kind of just having fun? It's like, well- there's of course a portion of that, but also like it's in the trial and error where innovation happens. And like, if they weren't yeah, constantly right. testing this out, then, you know, like we would just be sitting around still looking at images made on a computer of like SLS, for instance, you know, but, but instead there's this constant, <laughs> <laughs> this constant, not to like totally, you know, like make fun of SLS in a sense, but like, I mean, all but let's, let's talk happen. about that though. Yeah. That, let's talk about though. I mean, that that's been it's been a frustrating uh, experience watching you know NASA sort of really take the really slow, methodical approach with SLS, way over budget, way over delayed. And here you have these these upstarts down in Texas, just blowing shit up, just testing stuff out. They've taken the software development approach to fail early, fail fast, iterate, and continue to just you know learn from your experiences to be able to then get to an endpoint with much higher innovation and at a much faster rate. And so we're talking about now the next generation uh, uh, a spaceship for sp uh, st SpaceX here, just to kind of set the groundwork for people who aren't maybe as obsessed about this stuff as we are. Um, Falcon 9 was their first uh, successful commercial rocket um, that they were able to develop re-landing with, where they take the first stage of that booster and they bring it back to Earth and they land it. You still have the second stage, which gets discarded, so that's millions of dollars there. Um, and you also have the fairings, which now they're trying to catch with with ships, or whatever. So they've done an incredible amount of innovation to try to make that rocket as cheap and reusable as possible. But they've kind of hit; they're hitting the max about in terms of how uh, much they can bring the cost down there. They then, because Elon's main goal with this whole thing is to get to Mars, are, are developing this rocket Starship, which is huge, just incredibly much bigger than, than you know, uh, Falcon, can take a huge payload. His goal originally was 100 people at a time mm -hmm. to take them to Mars, and completely reusable is the goal here. So what they're testing here right now, sitting on this launch pad, is serial number nine, because they've already blown up eight of them, I think. <laughs> yeah, that last one was insane. Um, and, which is sitting on the, on the launch pad. And, and is going to be launching today to do the same test they did with serial number eight and hopefully not blow it up this time where they, they launch it up to uh, 15 kilometers 
They turn off the engines. They then turn it sideways to test uh, its orbital reentry, where in order to slow down, it does a belly flop through the atmosphere. So they're going to test that. It then has to relight its engines, turn, and then try to land vertically on the, on the landing pad, which everything went perfectly last time with, with uh, serial number eight. Um, but they didn't quite get the landing right, and it landed slightly too fast and exploded. So they're going to try to get that right this time. But the reason this is so exciting is that if they're able to get this ship functional and able to get it launched within the next year or two, we now have the potential to have these huge payloads going up to low Earth orbit, going to the moon, and then eventually going to Mars. And they're doing it in broad daylight, and they're doing it faster than NASA. So some people are saying we're going to we're going to actually even though Starship is only this tiny little thing on the on the launch pad, it's not tiny. Is this like uh, early iteration test vehicle? It, some people are thinking it could be out there before SLS, which has been in development for forever now. So like, it's been so weird to watch those two different methodologies play out in front of us. And it's hard not to get excited about SpaceX and Starship and feel a little bit frustrated with NASA, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, completely. I mean, even if you've ever looked at like a, a rocket comparison image, um, like SLS was always like that one that was just supposed to be like the biggest and the most powerful and the heaviest and the strongest. And it was all the way the one at the very, very end. It, it, it outbeat Falcon Heavy, it outbeat Delta IV Heavy, um, but it hasn't obviously flown yet. And now if you're looking at kind of rocket <laughs> images, Elon's like, no, I'm, I'm going to build a, a super heavy like uh, ro ro like lifter or rocket launcher. And and this is going to be called Starship. And that's going to be made of completely stainless steel. And uh, it's going to now be on it. So if you actually were to look at those, and it's one of my favorite things to sort of look at, it's like a, a chart of all the rocket comparisons. Um, you now got that yeah. Starship right there. And yeah, like you mentioned as well, reusability. You know, like, come on. Like, this is really yeah. like where we're at yeah. right now. And the fact that it's, this technology is is known and other companies aren't necessarily really incorporating mm -hmm. that as much, but, um, and I, well, other companies, I guess I'm right. more so talking about like the, the public entities. Um, but even then actually, uh, right. uh, to talk about France for a second. Um, so Ariane space, um, and Ariane group, like, so they've now developed, uh, Ariane six rocket and that one is going to is be partially reusable as well. And so they've even incorporated that too. And okay. that's a, you know, it's, it's a government run, um, agency. So, that's something too that's really I think important to, to keep in mind too that part of the European European Space Agency ESA, um, but yeah I mean to, to kind of look at the you know, SLS and, and and NASA and kind of make that comparison it's like oh come on like let's see some testing let's let's see us right. test this out but again right. it's like you were saying too it's tax dollars it's public money and so they have to be like yeah. extremely careful mm -hmm. about really like where where they're putting I guess that yeah. that spending towards because if that blows up you know. With Elon, he, he just probably obviously has to talk to his investors and is like, hey, like, yeah, it blew up, but that's part that's part of the, the testing. It's part of the experiment. Experiment. Don't worry. We already got five other, yeah. you know, serial number rockets in, in developed. We have like right. SN10 right. through 15 ready to go. And and those are gonna be rolling right. out as soon as the right. done. Um, but yeah, no, it's yeah. it's extremely important. As you mentioned, with it kind of doing its its horizontal turn and then back to vertical. Um, that is something that um, I believe is going to be the long-term plan as well for heading on over to the moon and Mars um, too, because there's going to be Starship yes. Luna too, which is going to be specifically for, yeah. for the moon and carrying yeah a, a, a lot of people on board too. Um, so just yeah. imagine being yeah, on that. It's amazing. Oh my God. I, I'm ready. I'm, I, I have full intention of flying on one of these things at some point. Are you excited for that potential? Are you, are you going to be going to space at some point? For sure. Yeah. I definitely see myself going to space. Amazing. Um, I, I'm, I'm more so heavily relying on like those prices coming down for space tourism, but, um, right. at least experiencing right. that. Um, I, my first goal though is to do just like a, a zero G flight, you know, like the, um, yeah. have you guys yeah. heard of that one? Yeah. So, I mean, it's essentially yeah. an airplane experiencing microgravity, but I'd love to do that. Uh, I think it would just be so much fun. I think those are about $6,000, but yeah, I would just be super, yeah. super fun. Well, we're saying it right now, 2021, we are planning to have a party in space at some point in our lifetimes. Yes. So we're all going to be there. We're going to just be jamming out on the moon, yes. on Mars, in some space station. You know, we've got Bigelow Space and all these other companies are talking about building space stations. Yeah. Let's talk for a brief second about uh, Bezos, Jeff Bezos' vision for the future of space light oh. versus um, Elon Musk's vision, where Musk yeah. is all about planetary um, uh, uh, not colonization. What's the word we're using? Settlement. I don't know. <laughs> uh, planetary. Uh, 
habitability yeah. where, where he wants to, you know, get humans on Mars in a long term sustainable civilization that if Earth has problems, that will continue to survive and thrive. Bezos whole vision here is O'Neill cylinders. Mm -hmm. One of the coolest concepts, these giant space stations that are self-sustaining, that have maybe rotating habitats, but they could actually be huge civilizations in all these different, um, you know, O'Neill cylinders spread out throughout the entire solar system. Uh, I, I think that Blue Origin, that's their goal is to be able to kind of enable, I think he said, a million people to be living and working in space in our lifetime. What is that going to look like? That is so cool to think about. Yeah. It makes me think a bit about like the expanse. Um, I mean, I, I feel like yes. almost every sci-fi movie has uh, their own rendition of the O'Neill cylinder. I mean, you have an orbiting space station right. that's created artificial gravity on board. And um, there was a great documentary mm -hmm. about Bezos and Amazon. Actually, I just watched, I'm pretty sure the documentary is just called Amazon. I don't exactly remember. And um, it, it actually shows um, Bezos um, on stage when he was introducing Blue Moon, which is going to be their lunar lander and kind of his vision for the future, exactly mm -hmm. what you were mentioning. He has this envision of actually having a presence in orbit, like low earth orbit, um, being out in space, orbiting mm -hmm. around probably also Mars, being between um, earth and Mars, being orbiting around the moon. And that's something that yeah. I think is going to be really exciting. I mean, having thousands of people living on this, this um, orbiting space station, but yeah, O'Neill cylinder is just so fascinating. And it, it kind of also makes me think a bit about when you look inside and it shows like at least the artist rendition, all this greenery. And it's just like, Literally, it's inside yes. this like a cylinder shape. It makes me think a bit about that um, yes. scene in Interstellar where um, they yes. went to this like yeah. fifth dimensional, yeah, like world. And I, I mean, that I think, I think honestly, that's fascinating. And that's coming from the richest man alive, like, you know, richest person on the planet. Like, uh, you know, I, that's again, privately funded company that that's, and it's coming from Amazon, which every single one of us probably has ordered from Amazon at least once in our life. And so, um, that's yeah. something that I, I see happening. I mean, he's what, like 70, 70 years old, probably, um, maybe a little bit younger. Bezos? How old is he? I, don't, I think he's Bezos younger. is young. Really? Musk and Bezos are in their 50s, I think. Well, I know yeah, Musk these are young is guys. younger, but are you sure? Wait, no way. I thought Jeff Bezos was. Yeah, I think Jeff Bezos is under 60. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. He's 57 years old. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's, he's 70. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Look at oh, that. Oh, man. Got yeah. him. Just These, under 60. But how amazing is it that literally the two wealthiest guys in the world now are are their their biggest goals now are to be doing these incredible space programs and, and we're just so fortunate. I know a lot of people are not fans of, of Musk and Bezos in terms of like their reputation as businessmen, in terms of how they treat employees, in terms of, you know, a lot of the kind of negative stuff that they've maybe had to like push the edge on in order to be successful with their visions. Um and I, I get all of that. But ethical it's hard practices, it, I think is what you're trying to say. Yeah. That practices. that one. Yeah. You know, and it, but it's hard as somebody who's excited about space, it's hard not to get excited about their visions and and the fact that, you know, they're able to implement some of this stuff with this with the incredible innovation that they brought to their respective industries before they got into space. You know, when we talk about Amazon, uh, since the pandemic has happened, you know, if you want to order something here in New York, in New York, and you're like, I don't want to use Amazon, I'm going to get it through, you know, B&H or Adorama or one of the other, you know, uh, electronics or camera stores. Uh, It'll take a week for it to get here, and sometimes it gets lost in the mail. The the USPS, the UPS, they've all been really struggling. And now, when you go outside, you don't see UPS trucks anymore. You see Amazon trucks. And if you order something on Amazon, it's here the next day, and it shows up reliably. Um, you know, they they even like bring it to your not just into your your lobby, but they'll bring it to your to your door up on the third floor sometimes. And and they it, it's amazing to see how they've taken this delivery uh, network and just completely blown everyone out of the water. Now let's take that innovation and let's apply it to space flight and to human, you know, humans being able to, to live and work in space. I see it as, as an exciting thing, you know, for us to get to witness and hopefully be a part of over the next few decades. So yeah, we're so fortunate to live at the time when we do, uh, just over four years ago, December of 2016, reusable space flight didn't exist. Mm -hmm. It was a dream of this crazy dude, Elon Musk, who wasn't yet the richest man in the world or the second richest. He was just this dude who was trying to build these companies that were insane. Tesla, that's never going to work. SpaceX, that's never going to work. You go back a decade, right? Even four years ago, both of these companies were at a stage where they both looked like they could fail within the year, right? And now... Both of these companies have just completely taken over their respective industries. Reusable space flight isn't just a pipe dream. It's been demonstrated over and over again at SpaceX, and now other companies are adopting it as well. 
How lucky are we to live at this time where spaceflight is now again something to be excited about. 2021 is going to be an incredible year. We are so thankful to get to share this hour, a little over an hour with you to, to you know, get excited about the upcoming year. Tell us, tell us more about, you know, the rest of your work that you have planned for this year and, and what else you're excited going forward. So the rest of the year, which is like pretty much the majority of it right now, um, is I am teaching right. um, actually at a school known as Dexter, which is a STEM based school. Uh, a lot of students are learning how to code at as young as like eight years old, nine years old. And I'm teaching an astronomy class wow. with them. Yeah. It's been super oh, exciting. Cool. Yeah. So we're working on galaxy simulations and understanding like black hole collisions, all of the above really cool thing is just mainly focused in, in astronomy. Um, and I think what's really exciting is being able to, if there is a launch happening during one of the classes, it's a live stream. So we were able to tune into any of the launches and catch that in real time. So that's something I've been really focused on is, is I've developed a curriculum for this class and um, I'm adding a lot more of that to my website. So I'm actually looking to sort of implement mm -hmm. a similar curriculum and syllabus actually for my website for any like anyone who wants to maybe just pick up a quick astronomy class, head on over to my site for that. Amazing. Um, yeah, so it's been really cool. Um, and I just developed a new feature on my site called the Space Globe, which essentially is a way to connect to people around the world for upcoming space events. Initially, it was um, developed wow. for in-person events, um, mainly because I was going to a lot of conferences and just a lot of like launches as well. But I would be going to them alone and I would just kind of network with people once I'm there. But that networking is what's really kind of led me to where I am today is meeting a lot of these people. Yeah. And so I was like, you know, I really want to find a way to connect people to each other too. Because a lot of times I just sort of connect people to each other through like messages or emails. And so I was like, how about I just build a platform where actually people can connect to each other around the world, uh, which exists through Facebook, but not necessarily specifically for the space industry or space events. So it's a 3D like interactive right. globe where people can kind of head to their, their country or another country and open up that location and see what space events are going on. And then um, eventually I'd like to add in like a chat feature where people can communicate with each other. And since everything's virtual right now, Amazing. it's mainly a lot of like Zoom events, webinars, that type of stuff. Um, so right. that's something um, I've actually been, I want to make it open source where people can actually co-create with me and like we can essentially develop it together similar to how Linux is. Uh, but mm -hmm. I, I'm trying to work more on like sort of that, that back end coding skills to get that up and running. So right now it, um, I just released it. So it's actually on my website and um, it just has events. Yay. Awesome. Yeah. So it kind of just has events around the world, but I would eventually put in like a user portion where we could communicate with each other and, and be connected in the space industry. That is so exciting. So that's at astroathens.com. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. So yeah, we're going to go check that out as soon as this is over and hopefully everybody else will as well. And besides your website, where else can people find you? Um, well, they can find me on pretty much any social media page um, at, at, as Astro Athens. So just type in astroathens.com, youtube.com slash astroathens, TikTok. Yeah, kind of all the same. Um, I just add a little bit of a variation essentially to each social media um, channel just based on mm -hmm. kind of how they have their system set up. Like TikTok is super quick and short. YouTube is more long format right. um, and, and doing that. Right. Um, and I will mention one more thing I'm working on. I just released um, a clothing line Please. and I'm releasing a second one and I'm using yes. all the profits to actually fund local astronomy clubs or develop local star parties. So that's something specifically I'm looking at awesome. New York City to do. But yeah, yeah. So that's... Yes. Uh, I'm going to join that club because I did just get my own new telescope <gasps> earlier this year oh my God. and I'm yes. very excited I got um, a Celestron um, stargazer so it has um, a connector on the top where you put your phone in and it has a mirror that it uses the camera on your phone to help uh, at your GPS to and your accelerometer and gyroscope to not only follow the telescope but to calibrate your phone to the telescope so that you can it can see where it's looking in the sky wow. and that way it can tell you all of the different celestial objects that are available to see that night. Wow. And then once you click on one, it'll just give you arrows to point in the direction to get you lined up 
to that celestial object. It's so cool, wow. but I've mostly just been using it in McCarran Park, which the lights haven't been dark enough. So I'm going <laughs> to take it into the city. It's not very, uh, it's not very heavy. So I can like put it on my bike or take it on the train. I'm so excited. So I want to join an astronomy club. Yes. <laughs> Why don't you check out heading to like Coney Island? Um, I actually caught, um, I believe I actually Ooh, caught a rocket launch there idea. that launched from, um, from Virginia. So it was really, really wow. far away, but I was able to just catch it yeah. right when it was it went out of sight. Um, but but there, it's a really good place though. I've, I've gone to Coney Island as well for meteor showers. So you might want to head there. Oh, um, that's a great idea. Yeah, Thank you. Of course. And could you send me I've a link I've been trying to, to figure out like, I want to know oh, what that absolutely, scope is. Absolutely. Thanks. Yay. Um, I'm so excited. I did a whole bunch of research because I wanted to get like a beginner telescope. Um, but this one, um, I had a Newtonian telescope as a kid and it was like this huge, like big bazooka on a tripod, but the tripod itself was like 10 pounds. The telescope itself was another like five or six. So like as a 12 year old carrying this thing around, it was <laughs> cumbersome. So I wanted one that was going to be, um, easy to just like break apart and walk to the park by myself or what have you. Um, so this fit really good into both the travel telescope size and also being able to be used in the city and dealing with, um, a lot of light pollution. Wow. Um, so I was able to see Mars the other night, which was really cool. Um, and I'm really excited because there's, um, I think it's called Cherry Park out in Pennsylvania <laughs> is a certified dark uh, site. <gasps> and when it gets just a little bit like warmer right before it opens up for the like summer season, because you can go year round, you just can't camp there. So right before the summer season, I'm going to take the telescope out there and do like a whole night oh. check everything out before all the tourists came and when come you and take go, it out. oh my goodness please go during a new moon you probably will see the milky way overhead as long as you go during a new oh, moon yeah. yeah if you're in a dark sky observing place yeah. you'll be able to see that oh i'm so excited for you i want to join uh, you so bad i hope i don't know maybe yes, by then. you absolutely should yeah. absolutely <gasps> that would be so awesome. so cool Oh my goodness. One other thing is hopefully that they'll open this again, but at Columbia University on their roof, they do, um, they used to do like astronomy nights once a month and they put all their telescopes oh, okay. out and people can come and look at Saturn and messier objects. And they usually will have a lecture of um, nice. someone who is at Columbia doing research and they'll talk about their research for about an hour mm -hmm. and it's free to attend. It's like super duper fun. Awesome. Yeah. So maybe they'll open that again soon. How do we find out about that? Uh, is it the astronomy program at Columbia? Go that to does that? astronomy. Um, sorry. Columbia astronomy outreach. Um, Cause my friend Summer Ash okay. helped okay. coordinate cool. that. Um, originally now she's at the VLA lucky in new mexico nice. a very large array um but yeah Poor thing. so, right? <laughs> so uh, definitely had a amazing yeah, so cool um at columbia university and wh where can people find your merch is that on your website so yeah i did uh link the it onto my website about? yeah I, I called it suit up so okay, for cool. the top of my, my website i have like flight um, journal which is my blogs um or like the articles of upcoming space events and etc mm -hmm. and then suit up is the the merch and then, yeah, other stuff you'll see there. Awesome. We'll throw a link to that in the description as well for people to check out. Thank you. This has been such a pleasure. Thank oh you so God. much for taking Absolutely. the time to come and chat with us. We are so excited for this year, for this decade, for the next decades in space flight. And we hope that we get to uh, do this again with you sometime and we have some more exciting things to talk about. Please, yes, um, please. you know, any, any new projects that you have coming up, please feel free to reach out. We'd love to have you on again to talk about whatever it is that you're working on. And February already. Let's get ready. February's yeah. next week. We've got, we've yeah, got Mars missions, ah, Mars so missions exciting. happening. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, so, exciting. so exciting. And when you're, when you're back in Brooklyn, um, let us know. We, we'd love to get together over a drink or something when, when this COVID thing is chilling out a little more. So. Absolutely. Definitely. And go stargazing. Yes. yes. Oh, I can't wait awesome. for that. Thank you so much, guys. This has been amazing. Thank Our you, pleasure. Athena. Thank you so much. And thank you for all the amazing work that you're doing. You are, you know, it's, it's wonderful to see what, you know, the excitement that you're bringing to science and space and, and it's contagious. And, and I hope that more people are inspired by it every day. So thank you again so much. Thank you guys. Have, Have a, a great, great rest of your day. You too. Bye All guys. right. Be well. Thanks for checking out this clip from our show. To watch more clips or full episodes, click on our profile below. 
If you want to stay up to date on all of our new episodes and videos, click subscribe. And if you have any ideas for future guests or topics that you would like to see us cover on the show, leave us a message in the comments or connect with us on any of our social media channels at Funtime Program or on our website at FuntimeProgram.com. We'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.